Welcome back to the Frith Guild Podcast. I'm your host, Eric. And I'm co host Scott. And today we'll be going over chapters 36 through 40 of World Serpent Arcanus. And as you can tell, we are dressed up for Halloween since this is going to be airing the day before, as those that are listening. So we want to wish everybody a spooky Halloween. Ooh. See everybody's costumes. So if you are uh, in costume for Halloween, shoot us a comment down below with your, ha- your Halloween costume in there. And as always, we always want to thank you guys for uh, supporting us and showing us some love by liking, commenting, sharing, rating, and uh, basically on any platform that you're listening this to. And as a change of pace for what we normally do as far as the chapter by chapter discussions, since Halloween and the mystical creatures that we're going to be going over in the bestiary section today because of the creatures that we see in this section of chapters i'm going to be doing that one on the 31st for halloween in particular and with that we're going to get into chapter 36 the great city state of militon ship log day 30 of being on the seas volk is nerding out about the next place they're going to which is militon and he's reading the, like the traveler's bo- brochure on this the the uh the travel agents you know got everything pulled up and it, telling him all the cool things he can do when he gets there and we find out that it actually just so happens to be created by a god creature the solo waters and i thought this was really interesting because as he's reading his brochure in the hotel lobby there uh, <laughs> figuring out what, what ex- excursions he can go on it seems like you know Celia waters kind of saves the island brings all this goodness Celia waters I'm assuming comes from the like the Greek Cilia myth, and it's a kind of a monster, not really the nicest creature. So I'm really curious how that's gonna play out. Oh my goodness, I didn't even realize that. <laughs> so Volk is on duty again, on guard duty with Riker at night, and he actually falls asleep during this. He's getting kind of complacent. I think he needs the chair needs to be taken away. I know when I was in the Marine Corps and you fell asleep on duty or something like that, somebody come up with behind you with a Sharpie and just like draw a line across your neck and be like, yeah, you're dead now. So that that's what I'm used to. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, just happens to be Fane that walks up on him and Fane actually is smelling death on Volt. And this is one of those really ominous, like if, if we had the kid from Harry Potter that tells us what the, the grim is, that he has literally two lines in the whole series about how it's the darkest omen of our world. Like this is it. And Volk is very unsure of how to handle this because Fane's like, I'm not sure if like you are death, like I, like you're going to die or there's a lot of people that are going to die around you, kind of like what the significance of this is. But this is one of Fane's innate abilities as a Wendigo Arcanist. You could be about to die. You also could be about to commit mass murder. So again, it's Volk, <laughs> like he... He's been marking people left and right. And again, he's I'm just headcanon. He's just being like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> takes out the whole excavation site. It's okay. I, right. I didn't mean to. <laughs> right. Exactly. So again, we, we can kind of expect either one, but I, I, hopefully it's Volk not dying, but people dying around. People that we don't like dying around Volk. All right. So we fast forward here to ship log day 35 of being at sea. And we are watching Eviana practice while he is basically reading about the city-state of Militon. And at this point, somebody is in the crow's nest of Gentle, wherever that would be. And they're yelling, Land Ho, as they see Militon coming closer and closer. And as they get to just about where the bay is for Militon, Eviana like, just freezes because she notices the Black Throne, which is the ship that the royal family sails around in, is in the bay, in the harbor. And that only means that Prince Rashawn is there. Rashawn is a bad man. Don't give the company to Rashawn. Not good. Not good. So before they exit the ship, I imagine that Guildmaster would probably do some kind of like liberty brief about how you should conduct yourself while you're in town and you know, not getting super drunk and making a fool of yourself, making a dis- dishonoring the name of the ship or the guild while you're in port because they've just been in, on the ocean for 30 some days. So 
Go a little stir crazy. She forgets about it, I guess. I don't know. It does bring us into chapter 37, King Rashan. So Rashan's protection is also there. You realize he's is a king, so he makes sense that he would have guards, but he's also got like a giant dragon with him. So that <laughs> helps a little as well. They're definitely on the search for the world serpent as well. So it's this point, Volk and, and team are like, it's it's a race at this point. You know, they don't have the rune stone, but we don't know what else they do have. You know, is there some other way that they figured it out? So it's really going to be a race to figure out where that layer is. They can't dock gentle exactly. <laughs> so they end up getting these ferry ships, these hopper ships to come ferry them to land. And their main goal is to really go find stock up on supplies, but also go find the Huntsman Guild to essentially check and see, you know, was the plague actually cured or do they have to try and figure out another way to, to cure Zaxxus? And as they're coming aboard, they go essentially through customs. <laughs> they get this really awkward customs interview <laughs> and it ends up being that um, Aviana lies about her age. She's like, oh, I'm 15 and Volk's like, you're 14. <laughs> She's like, it's only two weeks. And if I was the custom agent, I'd be like, I don't want to mess with this. Like, What does it matter that it's only a couple of weeks? Come on. Like, yes, technically she's only 14. She's bought it to a nightmare. Who cares? I know. she's She's got enough power as it is. As they're going through, um, they do find out that Rashan is set to be married to one of the counselors from the island. So again, amassing more power. And we do also get this little fun conversation with Nicolin where he's essentially took a bet out that Volk was just going to charge the Black Throne. So he's pretty pissed that he lost that, even though it would have <laughs> resulted in Volk going to c- confront Rashan. But either way. I mean, or would we be surprised if he did, though? No, not at all. <laughs> Ilya does kind of teleport them onto the roof and then... Nicolin was close, but bet on the wrong person. Eviana <laughs> runs and chases after the Black Throne. Uh, and we just get this feeling like first you have Ilya with her grudge chasing it, Volk going off on his excursion. Like, can we, for one book, can people just like stay on task? Shoot, you're right. I mean, we're book five and we got three people. <laughs> <laughs> and in book one, they ran away too to go on their own. <laughs> so even, even then they were... Oh, gallivanting around. I mean, Volk was gallivanting around in Thronehold. He just kind of wandered on his own. Yeah. So he just It's just natural. So chapter 38 is the Grim Reaper Arcanist. I love this because Eviana takes off. Volk goes after her and he does his like super cool shadow diving into, you know, diving into the shadows like a dolphin again. And I feel like it was probably like an eight, a good solid eight out of 10. I, I can't give him full 10 out of 10 because he didn't do any kind of like fancy flips or tricks while shadow diving. So no splash though. So that's a plus. It, but that <laughs> is, I guess, I mean, I guess all that's why I give him eight out of 10, you know, no splash, but no tricks either. So this, this kind of feels familiar again here with uh, some apprentice taking off and trying to get exact their revenge on somebody. And Zelfry is somewhere just banging his head <laughs> against a wall. Like that, or he's just like, God, thank you. This is <laughs> not my apprentice to deal with. Not my problem. <laughs> so the citizens, they're constantly talking about like how lucky the counselor is to be marrying the king, Rashawn. <laughs> like, no, screw him. Okay. Just don't like him. Avion takes off to the ship, the Black Throne. And as they're as Volk is getting closer, the the rampart falls down, and they make this huge grand entrance off the ship. They have the unicorn and the Pegasus Arcanus from the Argo Empire exiting, and you got Rashan coming off. He's probably doing his little princess wave to everybody with his with his dragon next <laughs> to him. And then finally, Counselor Chandra, who is his engaged or betrothed person. I guess we could use betrothed in this one. Betrothed, it works. He's actually betrothed. <laughs> For real this time, not just... <laughs> yeah. I just told that you're betrothed. <laughs> it's two-sided. It's... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a mutual agreeance. So, Counselor Chandra is walking down and the her, her Eldrin is following her. Volk actually had a couple minutes of 
remembering what it exactly was that uh, Eldrin is. And he describes the Grim Reaper, which is her Eldrin, as being only an executioner's cowl with dark cloak that has blood stains all over it. It's wearing a pair of rough leather pants and a thick belt with tall boots and a six foot long double bladed axe just floating, chilling behind it. And the blade is at least three feet wide. Pretty scary. I like that. And oh yeah, Volk, Volk is also supposed to be looking for Eviana. He kind of forgot about that when all the, the fancy parlor tricks, you know, Grim Reaper, Sovereign Dragon coming down the gangplank there. Eviana happens to just appear in front of Rashawn like she didn't think that any of this through. Just, I'm going to jump in front of my brother and accuse him of all of these things in front of everybody and everything will be fine. It's just so strange. Like she wanted her revenge, but it wasn't fighting him. It was like, I just want to yell at him. <laughs> I mean, that tracks for her. Like at this point in the story it tracks for her. <laughs> it just seems so strange. It's like, it does not feel thought out. Like I know you just rushed no. off, but like you didn't even think about it while you were running there. No, it was just literally like blind rage. And then like, I- I hate you. And like, that's as far as you get. So she she does start accusing Rashawn of exactly what he did. And she even calls uh, Lachel out to basically be her witness since Lachel is the dead queen. So I have a feeling that if she kept talking about what she did to achieve his seat or what he did to achieve his seat, he probably would have attacked her because you could tell that he's definitely put on the spot and like, uh, crap uh my lost sister yay you're alive oh crap <laughs> you're not happy <laughs> yeah how do i make this look good to for me and and he starts to give him the like oh my gosh i'm so glad for her to be back and safe and we can sit down and talk about what happened and she's like no you you killed oma no i don't want to but again she doesn't want to just talk so that brings us into chapter 39, Crimthon, the Sovereign Dragon. And so instead of just yelling at each other, now we get to fight a, a true form Sovereign Dragon. So luckily, Volk shadow steps in to save her. Dragon breathes fire. Fire is hot. Volk uses his shield and was able to luckily defend and hold off the fire. At this point, again, Aviana, what was your plan? Like She had no plan. There's no plan. What is a plan? What What is plan? <laughs> yes, what is plan? Who Better is plan? Yet, how is plan? Why is plan? <laughs> Eviana takes uh, a page out of Master Arcanus script and uses tears, but effectively uses them on the crowd as well. So everybody in the area is just excruciating tears going on. Volk shields he slashes he's trying to get in but he still ends up getting taken down and tackled essentially (laughs) by this dragon um he can't shadow step away because he's also essentially guarding the crowd so he's forced to really just sit there and kind of take it on the shield why does volk have to be such a noble goody goody two shoes and not let the citizens get burnt he's going to get no credit for saving them Oh, shoot, you're right. We, we got to keep working on lines to the ballot here, Volk. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I would have said, like, that would have been perfect because Crimthand, Crimthand is literally attacking another city-state. And even Counselor Chandra, I'm just going to call her Chandra. because So Chandra is even like, hey, you got to remember, this is my town here. Stop just blindly attacking things. Yeah, it almost would have worked better for him to let the crowd get hurt, as horrible as that is. But he's a little too noble. I guess. (laughs) Eviana tries to help, but it's a dragon. Like, she's just not effective. She doesn't really have good weapons. She's still pretty low level, you know, hasn't gained too many experience points. (laughs) Volk, at this point, is getting pretty fried by the dragon fire like the shield protects him but the fire's still going around the shield and it's pretty much like anything that wasn't directly in front of the shield gets burnt too so his ankles are getting burnt up his shoulders i think 
I'm kind of sad that the shield doesn't like eject magic back at. Like I was kind of hoping that that was coming that, that was going to stay. Yeah, it seems that when when they fixed or kind of upgraded with the star shards, that power is is now not there. So it's not reflecting anything back. It's just kind of taking it all in the chest. It wasn't in the stat sheet that he was going to lose that ability. Okay. No, we didn't realize when you evolved. You know, it's a it's a base form ability. It's a trinket ability. <laughs> Luckily, the one person who probably can save them does come to their rescue. Ilya teleports in, grabs them, teleports out. Volk is trying to lecture Aviana, but Zero is getting through to her. Ilya finally steps in and is like, yeah, I tried to do that same thing. It doesn't work. Just listen to Volk. Nicklin complains as well. He's like, I try and give advice. Nobody listens to me. You really shouldn't listen to Nicklin, but I, I feel his pain. <laughs> this is one of those only situations where like, okay, this is where you should probably listen to Nicklin. <laughs> the one time he has good advice. I feel like he was stating in the back away from everybody else. And he's like, oh, no, don't do that. Oh, darn. I tried. Ilya, go save them. <laughs> <laughs> and with that brings us into chapter 40, the hunt for the world serpent. I've decided that Gilly is just that one aunt that never had kids, but absolutely loves kids. And she's that like super happy aunt that whenever you call and you're like, hey, I need a babysitter. She's like, oh my God, yes. I'm going to give them all of the candy and let them stay up until whenever they want and give them all of the treats. Yes, she fits it very well. <laughs> but just the parents don't care because they just want to have a night out to themselves. Like that's what Gilly feels to me. So she, as Volk is literally having his wounds licked, uh, she's sitting there basically telling Volk that he really shouldn't be messing with Sovereign Dragons anymore. Even she Don't say. Even though he has a true form nightmare, flames still beat shadows. So Volk tries to go, and back, go back and talk to Eviana about what she did. And she agrees instantly about what she did was definitely not correct. And she's already come to the conclusion that and I quote, that I should listen to you more often. I even was like, mm, I feel for Zelfry so much. I know. And, That's the pain I have is Zelfry's pain. And all I can think about is the Abyssal Hells, Zelfry lucked out so bad, so well with this. <laughs> Eviana ends up giving Volk a hug and he even returns it like, not in the, not in a betrothed way, but I think she probably was like, mm, "He's he's he's falling for me. It's, it's happening." HR would not approve of this relationship. <laughs> he is her direct superior. <laughs> he writes the pros and cons. Come on, now that's that's definitely fraternization. It is. Bain and Volk are basically sent back into the city state and are trying to find somebody from the Huntsman Guild. I, I kind of hope that they run into the master arcanist. <laughs> I, you know, I would love to see Jevil meet Chandra just because of the, the Reaper Grim Reaper <laughs> thing. Just would chef's kiss on that one. Superiority complex coming oh, in. <laughs> oh God. Yes. You know it. <laughs> you look how long my chains are. And she's just like, yeah, no, I, I don't care. I've got Max. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Max. So as they're walking around, they run into an old drunk that's spreading all this information about people need, uh, that are wanting work, that are getting paid. Um, there are ships that are being put together to go and be mystical creatures or mystical seekers. And that they're essentially trying to get people to be able to go look for the world serpent. And Volk finally gets to the, like the center of the town. And, and this entire time that we've been there, it's just this awful stench. Like everybody just throws their, their waste out onto the streets. And even Fane and Wraith are like, this is disgusting. Volk finally finds the, the square of the town where the biggest attraction is, where the spring comes up out of the ground. And it looks nothing like the brochure. And I think that Volk should sue for false advertising. Yeah, he was let on. Horribly let on. And everybody around there is like, what are you talking about? This is how it's always been. So I don't know why you think it was going to be anything different. But 
He said, but the brochure. <laughs> I feel like he was just pulled up the book like, but but it says. It, it says Fountain Nice and I can get in an hour early. <laughs> <laughs> the East End Ven Rover said it was nice. <laughs> And this is where we finally get our confirmation that the second ascension is there. They know where the world serpent is and that they need people to help them get to because they see Mr. Peanuts guy or Mr. Monopoly guy that we saw back on the Isle of Ruma. Our <laughs> gentleman, our canist. Yes, Mr. Dapper himself. And this is where chapter 40 ends and we'll pick up next week. So this week's bestiary section, we have the Grim Reaper and the Sovereign Dragon. Because, again, Halloween, they just happen to be introduced in this section, and I love this. So with the Grim Reaper, these are very strange creatures that appear as floating executioner's hood to begin with. And they're able to be worn as an invisible person by an invisible person. In all reality, there is nothing inside of the hood, just like with Nightmares and the regular Reapers. The hood floats at head height and along with their double edge axe that floats alongside them. At first, their double edge axe is rusty and just like with the Reapers, their scythes are rusty. As they kill more, it basically polishes it more and they develop more of the outfit itself, just like with the Nightmares. I just love the fact that they have this double bladed axe and I don't know why it took me so long to be like, oh my god, that's... That's the, that's the axe. <laughs> Just like on every other book that she has, uh, she, some kind of weapon uh, from the series. So with the mythology of Grim Reapers, they're based off of the spooky stories about uh, curses left over from public executions. Prisoners or so-called witches and madmen alike would often try to curse or hex the audience right before they were hanged, shot, or decapitated trying to get them to basically stop from killing them. A lot of people thought that this was actual magic and would cause everybody who watched to die an unfortunate death. So basically they're just essentially discouraging these, ex these uh, public executions. The superstition is the basis for the Grim Reaper in the Frith Chronicles. Now, Grim Reaper's Trial of Worth is different than the Reaper, even though basically you have one reaper, uh, you, you basically can bond with any reaper. With the Grim Reaper, you have to bring the severed head of either of your parents as the bonding. Instead of with the regular reaper as just killing somebody in your family. Which really gives you two options. One, you sever the head and keep the head until you find a Grim Reaper. <laughs> Or you find a Grim Reaper and at that point decide that you're going to cut the head off of one of your parents. Do you think they'd be like, hey, take, I'll take this on credit? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a couple weeks. I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> I'll be right back. Can you follow me, actually? I, I, I'm just a couple islands over. Like, Just got to make a pit stop real quick. Can I borrow that axe? <laughs> <laughs> With Grim Reapers, they are tier two through four. And the only way for them to be able to increase their power is to continue their serial killing of the maker. Now, when we mean maker, that goes into the uh, reproduction of the Grim Reaper itself. It is a fable. The Grim Reapers are born from the blood of a serial murderer only once they've been publicly, publicly executed. And in the beast area itself, they def she defines what a serial killer is. And that's basically anybody that has a ritualistic fashion that has killed over 13 individuals. If they killed blonde people, just picking a you know random thing here. If they kill blonde people and then they become a grim reaper, their arcanist starts to kill blonde people. Then they become more powerful. Now with their evocation, they have draining gases. The Grim Reapers are able to evoke a cloud of gas that drains the physical strength of all nearby living creatures. This doesn't have any effect on the undead, though. They're able to manipulate dead bodies, and they are able to animate them once more. The dead bodies do have access to physical skills they had in life. So if it's a dead archer, being they're able to shoot a bow and arrow, that kind of thing. Augmentation is paralysis. They are able to... 
individually gain superhuman strength. And when they augment others, they cause full body paralysis. When Grim Reapers go to imbue items, it basically gives it undead traits as far as uh, gives the wearer or the wielder immunities to death or heightened physical traits. Now, the passive abilities, and this is one of my like favorite things that I feel almost makes this OP, is that once they gain tier three, their axe causes an instant death. So you get nicked by it as a tier, th- if the Reaper is a tier three. And you did. Now, along with this instant death from their axe, Grim Reapers are also immune from instant death effects. So if a Grim Reaper kills another Grim Reaper or a Reaper, they don't die from the King's Revenge. And lastly, with the Grim Reapers being able to merge with their Arcanists, they live and die as a single being. And they also empower their Arcanists with speed and strength along with theirs. Now, moving on to their auras, they have what's called Blood Curdle, which causes a red moon to appear in the sky, and then basically along with a normal moon or sun. And its glow prevents magical healing from all sources of Tier 4 and below. So, Sovereign Dragons, literally everything. Like, they are death incarnate. Like, we, we see all these dragons being these super OP powerful thing beans and then here the grim reapers are just like nah hold my beer (laughs) now their true form is a gaze so they have to accomplish something in order to achieve a true form and their true form challenge is that they must kill another grim reaper arcanist in order for their elder to transform because iron sharpens iron and they can't die from the king's revenge so why not you know, once a Grim Reaper has achieved its true form, the Executioner's outfit becomes a spectral shroud. It's basically like a ghost and it takes the shape of whatever it wants. It's mostly inco- incorporeal and the axe becomes extremely ornate. Its ability as a true form is the Nightmare Visage. What happens is when the Grim Reaper merges with their Arcanist, it, it, its appearance changes to resemble the thing their opponent most fears. So. This causes the enemy, it tricks the enemies, and it's a trick of the mind, but not an actual transformation. So anybody that is immune to mind effects probably would be immune to this. So Nightmare Arcanus, other Reaper Arcanus, more than likely wouldn't have any problems with this. But we see how bad terrors affect people with the Master Arcanus. <laughs> so I can only imagine having an individual, like an actual Reaper doing this, Grim Reaper doing this. And then in world lore, the Grim Reapers and the Arcanists are always seen as bad omens. The worst omens in our world. (laughs) (laughs) They represent the worst of humanity. But due to their power and their death abilities, few dare challenge them. For a short time in history, a council of Grim Reaper and Reaper Arcanists ruled over a powerful city-state where people were were killed in mass in order to produce more fable mystical creatures like the Reaper. The Sovereign Dragon? Also extremely powerful. So they're described as being muscled dragons with black and red scales, leather and wings and horns. They're curved forward like a bull's. They grow to massive sizes, almost as large as three-story buildings and have claws that can cut you in half, like literally cut you in half. From mythology, they are based on kind of the old legends of kings and emperors. So In China, there's a term called the Mandate of Heaven, which states that there should be one ruler because they're sort of powered by the gods. Likewise, in England, it was said that a single noble king could bring prosperity. So these legends influence the power of the sovereign dragon being the one true ruler. In order to bond with them, they have to participate in a grand competition where the final test is a duel to the death between all leftover participants at that point. They are tier four being a dragon and they do reproduce through progeny. So they make their nests in the heart of nations, preferably near castles or other large courtrooms. They reproduce every 10 years and consume a large amount of fresh meat. And that's when we saw the egg in the turn- sovereign dragon tournament to bond with the, the hatchling. This is surprising because even in Colosseum, Arcanus, they were like, this just never happens. Like they don't reproduce on a schedule like uh like the phoenixes do but i guess here we have confirmed that they do actually once a decade 
but I guess they have to consume a lot of flesh. They are able to evoke white flames. So these burn hotter than the flame of other typical dragons, and they're able to manipulate the weather. So this can be all across the a kingdom and essentially expands the territory of the dragon and helps with the training of um, the arcanists can expand the area as well. They are able to augment willpower. So when they augment others, they give them additional willpower, additional mental fortitude, um, passion, perseverance, all of that. Uh, and this can really help individuals break out of mind controlled abilities. So things where we saw you had to break out of the mental prism for the true form ethereal whelk could be boosted by a sovereign dragon potentially when um, augmenting themselves they become immune to domination and illusions when imbuing they do help create mystical items that embolden the person who used them and they also have passive abilities related to immunity to fire we did see the prosperity aura, so it creates no visible manifestation, but plants grow faster, individuals make better decisions, the nation has increased ambition. So it really just is designed to help build the nation as a whole, rather than kind of influence any, any one specific person. Their true form virtue is they have to embody the traits of an autocrat. So that's what we saw with King Rashan. So as soon as he bonded, true form, because he had that full authoritarian value. When they get to their true form, they do get an extra set of smaller wings, their horns curved together into a crown, and they gain the ability of the greatest nation. So it improves their aura, so it becomes larger and, and more powerful. In world lore, they are seen as natural leaders. So they've always been seen as rulers of nation um, and as long all throughout history, especially with the prosperity or it makes sense for them to be in power. Because of this, some nations only allow sovereign dragon arcanists to be kings or queens. Uh, and this is just to ensure that they always have that aura to help the nation. I mean, as far as like a overall standpoint, sovereign dragons are a pretty impressive nation building Eldarin. That's for sure. Very specific purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. Hate Rashawn. Absolutely hate Rashawn. But that's freaking awesome. That it, it has a crown of horn. Like its horns form into a crown. It is. The description of it was just so cool when it first happened. You're like, okay, that's pretty badass. One, and it was such a huge thing that like, oh my gosh, you could literally bond with and get a true form all in one go. Like Right away. All right. And with this, again, this is going to, we're going to be having this on Halloween day for those. Um, so definitely, definitely happy and excited that we are able to get these to talk about these two mystical creatures. We do want to thank everybody for listening today. And that reminder that in about a month and some change, we got uh, the Labyrinth Arcanist coming out on December 10th. And I assume future us is going to tell past us what, whether we have nickel and plushies in the future or not. So I'm going to be super excited to find that out. I know. I want my plushie. I do too. <laughs> Eric, Scott, and I want to thank everyone for listening today. We post a new episode every Wednesday morning at 11 Eastern, 10 Central, and 8 Pacific Standard Time. We are on all podcasting platforms and are also on YouTube as well for video. After the additional episode airs, we post chapter-by-chapter chapter videos every day in a smaller, easier-to-digest format. We do want to give a special shout-out to the final member of our team, Dan Mackison, one of the admins for the Frith Chronicles wiki, link listed below, and doing his best to keep everything running smoothly behind the scenes. If you want to reach out to us, you could email us at frithguildpod at gmail.com or on Facebook or any other social media by searching for Frith Guild Podcast. Just to remind everybody, we have links to everything in the description below on both the podcast and YouTube. Scott, do you have anything else you want to add this week? Does Time Marked 2, when does that come out? Oh, um, I know in November, I think. I'm... It's like the... I'm trying to get to my notes as well. November 12th. Okay. So November 12th, we have a new... Time Mark Warlock. I believe it's 24-hour Warlock, if I'm not mistaken on the, the title of it. 
can feature me, can tell past me <laughs> if I'm right or wrong. Because time, time manipulation works. It, it works because it's time Mark Wolock, so. It does. And it'll be good, too. I have no doubt about that. Yes. John, I know John, uh, Shami's husband, has constantly been saying that it is even or as good or better than time marked warlock so super excited about that i think we'll catch you guys next week